Hello, Soundies. Welcome to our Sound for Video session today. It is the 16th of July, 2023. Great to have you here. And let's jump right on over to our agenda and cover what we're going to talk about today. So first, we have the new Tascam DR10L Pro in-house here, and we're going to talk a little bit about that, And then, which is a body pack recorder. Um, so not wireless, but a body pack recorder. And then we have some questions that were submitted ahead of time. We'll get to those, and then we'll come over to the chat and answer any questions that we have there. Um, just as background for today, we're using our, uh, this has been our pretty typical um, signal chain for the last little while. We have our Earthworks Ethos microphone into the Mackie DLZ creator, uh, line out into the Canon C200 camera. That comes into a Blackmagic ATEM Mini, and then that goes out to an um, Epiphan Pearl Nano Encoder. So that's our signal chain today. Okay, let's go ahead and jump right into the Tascam. So let's switch on over to our overhead camera here. So in 2017, I reviewed the original Tascam DR10L, um, which is a body pack recorder. So it looks a lot like a wireless transmitter, but it's just a recorder. And um, just as a quick kind of look at things here, we have the control buttons are on the bottom here. We have a switch here for power and recording. You can see it there. There's a headphone jack right there. We have a USB-C port here, and we have the SD card slot right here. You can see we just can pop that open, just a little rubber cover that sits over the micro SD card. And working that back in, I have found is a little bit of a job, but it does seem to seal pretty nicely. There we go. It does have a belt clip here for attaching it to the belt. And then you have the indicators here for what each of the buttons represent uh, just there. And then um, we do have dedicated headphone volume now, which is nice. We have the menu button, which will get us into the menus, and we'll we'll do that in just a minute here. Uh, it does come with the this lavalier microphone, and with that, of course, comes a lapel clip and a metal mesh windshield, as well as a USB-C to USB-A cable. So that's what comes in the box with it. You can also buy it in the kit. It does not have the Bluetooth capability by default. Um, you can order the kit with it, or you can buy the Bluetooth adapter later. It looks strikingly similar to the Bluetooth uh, module that, count, that that you can use for a lot of the Zoom products, like the um, the Pod Tracks and the Zoom F6 and the Zoom F3, as I as I recall. Um, but it fits more it fits a little bit more flushly up here on top. We do have a locking connector for the lavalier microphone, so it's a 3.5 millimeter TRS locking. And then um, let me just go ahead and power this down for just a moment here. So you just uh, move that switch to the bottom and hold it there for, I think, about five seconds. And then we have this retaining clip up top. You can pull off, and then once that pulled off, the Bluetooth module. I know it's all hard to see this right now, but this is the Bluetooth module here. So you can see that. That looks a lot like the... Let me grab the zoom one. It may actually be... I don't know if it's either identical or just similar. The zoom one's a little bit different and a little different in size, a little wider it looks like, but similar concept. There's the zoom and here's the Tascam. Tascam zoom. All right. So let's pop that back in here. And it just seats right in there like that and then there's this kind of rubberized retaining clip that fits over it. That's actually a pretty nice finish. As I like that better than on most of the Zoom products, where you have quite a quite a bit sticking out. Um, this has a little bump, but it's fairly low profile. Versus, let's see here. Here is the, for comparison, here's the Zoom F3. And its module fits in like that, and it sticks out quite a bit, and it doesn't have anything that retains it in there. So Tascam, I think, has done a nice job. Why Why exactly that's a separate module, I'm not entirely sure. 
if I had to guess, they're trying to hit a very aggressive price point. So the, the DR10L Pro by itself, let's switch back over to the Mac here. Uh, by itself, um, without the Bluetooth module, is essentially $220 US. And then with the Bluetooth module is $260. Of course, as I mentioned before, you can buy that module independently as well. So if you want to add it later, it's $39. Okay, so back over to the overhead cam here. All right. So a couple of things that make the DR10L Pro a step forward from the original DR10 are, well, two main things from my point of view. Number one, are the Bluetooth capabilities, so the wireless control capabilities, and that includes remote control via an app on your phone, so both iOS and Android. And let's just see if we can get this going here. There we go, we're connected now. You can actually control multiple uh, DR10L Pros with the same app, uh, so that's a pretty nice feature. Um, in addition to Bluetooth wireless control of the unit itself, and you can change many of the settings. So you can turn, you can control the limiter. There's actually a limiter, uh, low cut filter. You can start and stop recording, I believe. Yeah, you can start and stop recording remotely, which is really nice. You can lock it. Presumably you can lock it. <laughs> we'll look into that more. Um, so some pretty nice features there. Let's see. I wonder if you can change. Oh, here we go. You can change the recording settings. You can change whether you're recording in 32-bit float. We'll talk about that a bit more in a moment or 24 or 16-bit. Uh, the file format, whether you want wave, uh, MP3 at a higher bit rate or lower bit rate. Um, the sample rate, whether 44.1 or 48, does not do higher than 48. Um, you can put markers in there, it looks like. I, I'll have to look at that in more detail, but the, you get a lot of, of quite a nice quite a nice control app, it looks like. So you can play back files from it as well, it looks like. I don't believe that you can monitor the audio from this device, but that's TBD. I have to check that out. In fact, let's go ahead and check that right now. So I'm going to put a little headphone adapter here on the iPhone, and then we'll hook up a set of headphones here to it. Just going to jiggle things a little bit there. Sorry about that. But it's my understanding you can watch the meters, but I don't think you can monitor, but let's find out for sure. Okay, let's hooked up some headphones. And I'm just adjusting the headphone level there. I don't think that's doing anything. Check it here. That's actually the ringer. So I don't believe it's doing anything there. So unless I'm missing something, yeah, I can definitely hear it when I plug into the headphone jack on this, but not hearing it through the phone. So more to do on that in terms of assessing and making sure that you cannot monitor remotely, but it doesn't look like you can, initially at least. Ah, one of the big things we talked touched on earlier, though, is that you do have the ability to record in 32-bit float. So that's a big step forward for the Tascam. Now, what that means in this case is that they have said in their marketing materials they're using dual analog to digital converters. Um, when it comes to input levels, when you come in here, uh, if we go into the record level, we just have a few different settings here. We have low, mid, low, mid, high, mid, and high. So they're not even giving you um, anything along the lines of like, you know, plus. 15 dB or anything like that. So oh, it looks like the uh, app disconnected. Oh, there it goes. Okay, we're back on there. Can't see the phone. There we go. So, um, so 
it is using dual analog to digital converters. So let's go ahead and switch on over to the Mac and let's just, again, review what that looks like in practical terms here. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and, first of all, you can see <laughs> the audio is clipped. And in fact, as a sample here, here's a, I took a, a similar recording in 24-bit and let's just pull this down. And you can see that the waveform is right up against zero dB. It's just a dual mono recording here of some dialogue. And when I pull it down, this is again a 24-bit file. This is what it sounds like, roughly, of reverberation. Let's come out into a more open space here in my basement area. All right, I'm going to talk really loudly here so that we are probably clicking. We have clipping. We have the uh, input level set to the high setting. All right, so that's that's what would happen if you were not using 32-bit float. Now, if we switch on over to the 32-bit float recording, I'm going to pull this down a little bit. Notice that when I pull it down now, it does, of course, retain the waveform. It can recover the waveform. And here, for example, this part here that was especially clipped, I can come in and just highlight that and pull that down to the same level here. And so this is what it sounds like now in 32-bit float. You can see that it picks up plenty of reverberation. Let's come out into a more open space here in my basement area. All right, I'm going to talk really loudly here so that we are probably clicking. We have clipping. We have the uh, input level set to the high setting. So you have a few different settings. It doesn't even give you the dB level. It just says high, medium high, medium. Okay, so that gives you a sense for, again, the magic of 32-bit <laughs> float using multiple converters. So those are, those are kind of the highlights of the Tascam dr 10 Let's pause here. Let's go take a look at the chat and see what's going on in the chat. Danny's going to look through here. I know uh, Christopher had a question up front. Yeah, does this have a TCXO, which is a temperature compensated crystal oscillator or a very proper time code clock in it like the zooms or sorry in it or is it like the zooms and useless for time code when they go out of range of the ultra sync blue <clears throat> context for what uh, christopher's talking about so this uh, the tascam dr10l pro with the wireless the bluetooth module can communicate and receive time code from a time code generator like the ultra sync blue which is now a company now owned by atomos um, previously, it was time code systems. This is actually a time code systems module before they were bought by Atomos. Um, so this generates time code with a proper temperature compensated crystal oscillator and wirelessly jams itself to the TAM or the, the Tascam to it every second or so. And so it's just saying, okay, here's the time. Okay, here's the time. Okay, here's not the time, and it just keeps track of that. Now, when the Tascam starts recording, it records the time code at the time you start the recording. That's all it does. And um, Christopher's question is, does the Tascam itself have a temperature compensated crystal oscillator or a proper time code clock in it? And my sense is no, it does not. It's just taking time code wirelessly from the UltraSync blue. So just to answer your question, um, is that useless? Uh, for a $219, pro well, $260 product, once you add the Bluetooth module, I don't think it's useless. I think it's um, it's hitting a specific market and working well for that market. For those that are, you know, I think, I think it's a good fit. I think it's a good set of features with the appropriate sacrifices given the, the price point for this particular device. All right. Next one, will it jam sync time code? So it will receive time code from an ultra sync blue. That's how it will work, or an AtomX module, as I believe it. So if you're using an Atomos recorder and you have the AtomX module with it, it will, um, I think you can jam, it, it can, the AtomX module can send time code to the Tascam, or you can use an ultra sync blue to do that. So it's, it itself, you don't, you can't just connect it with a cable or wirelessly jam it at the start of the recording session and then walk away. You have to have um, a device that's constantly sending time code to it wirelessly. So that's how it works. Okay. Our Tascam and Zoom, owned by the same parent company now, would explain why they use the same 
broken Bluetooth stuff. Well, I, I would challenge you, Christopher, I don't see it as broken Bluetooth stuff. I see it as a consumer grade solution or maybe a prosumer solution. Um, I don't know if they're owned by the same company or not. I don't believe they are. Um, I believe Tascam is owned by TIAC and, and um, Zoom is its own thing. So two Japanese companies, as I understand it. So um, I don't believe they're the same thing. But I think what's happening is that Atomos bought Timecode Systems a few years ago now, um, probably four or five years ago now. And what they're doing is they're working with various audio product manufacturers to implement their wireless time code capabilities. So I think that's what's happening. Okay, anything else in the chat? Nothing at the moment? Wait, maybe. Just trying to find out if it competes with the tentacle. Um, this and the Zoom F2 and... Uh, I, I would put these in kind of the same category, and I would say that they're not, they're, they can work with timecode, but they themselves are not timecode generators. So they can receive timecode, but they are, they're not, they don't have timecode generators built into them. So they're kind of at the, the end of the chain, if you will, of the timecode chain. They are not themselves generators. So a little bit different. Whereas with a tentacle sync track E, that actually has a timecode generator built into it. So it approaches it a different way. Incidentally, um, the one thing to keep in mind is that the different wireless schemes, so Atomos has their Atomex scheme, what previously time code systems. They're working with other manufacturers to make that, to make them interoperate. Um, however, Tentacle Sync does not do that, at least not presently. I don't know if they're in talks with other manufacturers to do that. Um, so they don't do that presently. And Zoom appears to be joining up with Atomos to, to use their system, to use Atomos's system for the wireless time code. So anyway, Danny says, I've never purchased a Zoom recorder, always preferring Tascam. Tascam has been around production audio forever. Zoom started in the music business. Yeah, I agree with that. I think Zoom is very much more focused until they launch their um, F8 in 2015, I think it was, maybe I think it's 2015. Um, so they're dipping their toes into the into the prosumer field recorder market. Um, but mostly, I think you can really consider them a, a company that mostly services. They say we're for creators. That's their new tagline. But previously, it was largely for musicians. So good. Okay. Dean Anderson, um, is there a software for 32-bit to even out the overmodulated and soft areas for the entire audio clip with one click. There are auto levelers, yes. Uh, Isotope RX has one, in the, at least in the advanced version. Um, there is one in DaVinci Resolve as well, so to, to an auto leveler that does a similar type thing as well. Um, in the case of RX, it's, um, it's an offline process, so it is basically a one click. It processes it, and then it then you have it. In the case of DaVinci Resolve, it's actually a real-time processor. So it's autumn, It's as you're playing back, it's doing the leveling for you. So the results are, take some work to kind of dial in, but yeah, Dean, there are some options there. Technical Sync has one third party using their time code sync now. I forgot who one of the small two-channel wireless in a charger box vendors. Okay, maybe it's um, DJI or or one of the others. Okay, good to know. So it looks like they are starting to work with others as well. I think that'd be that's good. It, it, it makes sense to make them interchangeable. Um, it's a little frustrating when it's proprietary, or it can be depending on what you've, what features you need. So, all right, um, we have another question. Oh, here we go. How many Tascams can connect to the mobile app and is the Tascam software available for laptops? Um, no, it's, it's for iOS, whether phones or iPad. And it is available for Android. As far as I'm aware, it's not available for um, desktop operating systems, laptops or, or desktop computers. And I believe it's four at the same time. I'm not 100% positive on that. Um, we'll be doing a full review. This is just a preview. I've only spent a couple of hours with this right now. Um, but let's see if we have anything that's really quick that says how many you can control at the same time.
uh, control to five DR10L Pro units at the same time. So up to five is your answer there. Um, they also confirm here, if you go back to the Mac really quick here, audio monitoring via app is not supported. Um, that's a big question. I, I, this is the B&H side. I imagine they've gotten that question a lot and they're, they're, they want to make sure people are aware you, you cannot monitor the audio via the app. So there's confirmation on that. Okay, um, let's see. We have another question. Uh, for two big sorbets. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Camille. Appreciate that. Hope everything's going well for you and appreciate the super chat. All right, let's head back over to the 10, uh, DR10L and take a look at what else we've got going here. Uh, okay, so just to kind of run through things again, bringing the phone into the frame here. Um, again, you can choose file format. You can use uh, MP3 or WAV. You can choose whether you want it in mono, mono or poly. And I'm not sure. And maybe you can connect. I'm not sure what that means. I'm going to have to look more into that. Whether it's just doing uh, a mono file, like a single track, which is what I've all the recordings I've done so far have been. I've done just been a single channel WAV file. Or if you put it to poly, if it's just doing dual mono which is what I suspect it's doing. Um, again, record format, you've got 44.1 and 48 kilohertz for your sample rates. You can drop down to 16 or 24 bit if you wish to. Um, time mark. We'll have to look into that one a little bit more to see what that one's all about. And peak mark, I believe this is um, putting metadata markers in. If you do get up to zero dB, it will put a, a metadata marker in there so you can quickly go in and lower those portions, uh, recover them if you're recording in 32-bit float. So that's a that's a pretty nice feature. You can also save your presets and load your presets, and it looks like these are the files. You can see what files are available currently on the recorder. If you come in here, it'll tell you um, some information about them. And it looks like... You can change the file name right here on the app, which is nice. And it does record the format, the date, the duration, and the size. Okay. And then here's the view where if I had multiple DR10Ls, you would see each of the five listed here. Up to five, I should say. Gives you a little bit of information about what's currently running. I think the trick is, I have to confirm this, but in my experience with it so far, um, you cannot use Bluetooth Sync and the remote app at the same time. So that's a pretty substantial limitation that's important to understand if time code is going to be critical to your workflow there. So you would then use the app basically to set it up initially and then disconnect from that, um, pair with the uh, Bluetooth time code generator, like the blue here, sorry for the camera bump there. And um, and then through the duration of the shoot, you would just have this sending time code to the Tascam. So workflow-wise, that's how that works. And um, I don't know what your impression was, but when we played back that 32-bit float, it seemed to do pretty well. Um, that was recorded at the high input setting, and then I had to work to, to get it to clip. So you're not going to get a ton of clipping, um, but that's what that sounds like just so you have a sense there. And then let's go back over um, evaluating the quality of the lavalier microphone. Let's just listen to this again. And um, I'm probably going to apply some EQ. And in fact, I'll just go ahead and pull that up right now. Let's go ahead and pull in our EQ. We're going to get a parametric equalizer. Let's just get it back to default here. And I'm going to go ahead and tune that while we're playing it back. And Let's see what we can get. Okay, we're recording on the Tascam DR10L Pro, and I want to do a couple of things. First, I want to come up here into this very reverberant space. It's an omnidirectional microphone that it comes with, and as an omnidirectional microphone, you can see that it picks up plenty of reverberation. Let's come out into a more open space here in my basement area. All right, I'm going to talk really loudly here so that we are probably clicking. We have clipping. We have the uh, input level set to the high setting. 
So you have a few different settings. It doesn't even give you the dB level. It just says high, medium high, medium, medium low, so on and so forth. So it doesn't give you a lot on there. Let's see how this comes out in post-production. Okay, we're recording on the Tascam DR10L Pro. And I want to do a couple of things. First, I want to come up here into this very reverberant space. It's an omnidirectional microphone that it comes with. And as an omnidirectional microphone, you can see that it picks up plenty of reverberation. Let's come out into a more open space here in my basement area. All right, I'm going to talk really loudly here so that we are probably clicking. We have clipping. We have the uh, input level set to the high setting. So you have a few different settings. It doesn't even give you the dB level. It just says high, medium high, medium, medium low, so on and so forth. So it doesn't give you a lot on there. Let's see how this comes out in post-production. Okay, we're recording on the Tascam DR10L Pro. And I want to do a couple of things. First, I want to come up here into this very reverberant space. It's an omnidirectional microphone that it comes with. And as an omnidirectional microphone, you can see that it picks up plenty of reverberation. Let's come out into a more open space here in my basement area. All right, I'm going to talk really loudly here so that we are... Okay, so there's probably something that I would do again. It depends on the entire mix, but it does have a little bit of... Um, kind of a little bit mid-range hype in it, I would say, that lavalier microphone that comes with it. But it's not bad. Um, I would say it's pretty decent. I would not. I think the first question I get a lot of times with these recorders is, what lavalier microphone should I upgrade to? <laughs> and some of them are not great. Um, this one seems okay. Um, it's not tiny. If we go back to the overhead here, um, it would take some work to hide something like this. Uh, it's maybe just a little bit bigger than the... Um, Sure, Twinplex TL48. It's it's bigger, but um, and I haven't I haven't really tested the cable noise and handling noise, but um, not a bad not a bad lavalier. I think they did an okay job here for a for a bundled lavalier microphone for a two hundred and twenty dollar device. Seems pretty decent to me. So, okay, and then back over to the Mac again. Let's take a look at that curve. Um. Just get it out of the way. So I did, yeah, again, I have a cut here at 425 hertz, another one at 1,021 hertz, another one at almost 2 kilohertz, and then I did have to boost some of the high end. So, or, or I chose to boost some of the high end, whether you have to or not is, is another matter. Um, but anything over, in this case, 6,600 um, hertz, I did, a, I did a boost there just to kind of add some crispness and and brightness back to it. So let's go ahead and ch uh, check back in on the chat and see what people have to say or what questions you might have at this point. Uh, oh, battery. Yeah, we haven't covered the battery yet. Um, how long does it last? That is one drawback of the tracky. The battery is not field swappable and you only get about 10 hours. So let's come back to this here at overhead. So I'm going to go ahead and power off. So the beautiful thing about the Tascam DR10L, and that's another big actually step forward, is that it is powered by two user-replaceable uh, AAA batteries. And they say that with two lithium AAA batteries that you can expect up to 24 hours. And then I believe it was, let's take a look here and see what the battery time was here. They say up to 24 and a half hours if we switch over to the Mac here. Uh, up to 24 and a half hours on a, on two lithium batteries. Uh, additionally, this is a this is a separate thing, but it's files are saved every 20 seconds during recording, so data loss due to unexpected power supply interruptions are kept to a minimum. So in essence, it's closing the file every 20 seconds so that it gets written to the SD card. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, in case you do lose battery, and then if you're using regular alkaline, I think it's closer to. I don't remember the exact numbers they cited before, but evidently closer to 16 hours or something like that. To me, the nice thing is that you can replace the batteries. So that's a really nice thing. Excuse me, I'm going to take a drink really quick.
All right. Anything else in the chat there, Danny? Okay. Um, how many cams could a Tascam cam if a Tascam could Tascams? <laughs> um, I don't know. The answer, I don't think that that's an answerable question. Um, Danny, I'm all in with Tentacle Sync with four track E and five sync E's. This is great stuff, but limited number of devices, perhaps due to bandwidth limits on Bluetooth to sync more than a dozen devices. I don't know what kind of productions you're working on, Danny, but if you've got more than... Uh, I guess I guess for audio recorders, you could easily get up there pretty quickly. Um, yeah, no, that makes sense. It's getting to the point, this is uh, back to the logician, it's getting to the point where we need six phones with Bluetooth and Wi-Fi just to control all the devices these days. That is a great point. Um, having an app that runs on a phone is, I think, is a, is a more of a consumer pro feature I, by, I, by, let me clarify what i mean by that consumers usually love that um <laughs> when you're working professionally if you've got more than one device or one set of devices that need a an app it gets really cumbersome really quickly because you're switching between apps all the time and it's a it's not a great experience and even you know i think even for you know production sound mixers for example with a, an eight series recorder from sound devices I think the idea is if you're going to use something like an iPad or an Android tablet, that you should have that dedicated for that device and not try to, to use it for everything else as well. So definitely a um, there's a pro, that's a pro and a con. So it keeps the price of the device way down. The screen on this thing is tiny, tiny, tiny. Um, I have to put these special glasses on to be able to read it. If we go back to the overhead here. I mean, this is, um, what can I put in there for reference? This is my phone, and it's one of the larger iPhones. Um, but that screen is teeny tiny, um, so that is not easy to read, and that's why the app becomes so much more valuable. And if you are using a ton of other apps for other things as well, then it gets to be a little bit of a, a crutch, if you will. Okay. Mark, can you plug a COS 11D into the Tascam? Curious to know how it sounds with a different mic. I can go grab one. Um, I believe the Tascam supplies 2.3 volts of bias power or plug-in power. Technically, the, te the cost 11D requires three to 10 volts. If you'll give me just a moment here, um, we'll put on some music and I will go grab that. So <laughs> here we go. Okay, so I have the cost 11D here. Again, I'm not, I don't have the Tascam connected to the live stream. So what that means is that I need to do a recording and then import it into the computer and then we'll open it and listen to it there. So I would, I would caution that undervolting your lavalier microphones, especially for an extended period of time is probably not the best idea. This one's wired for Sennheiser. Um, I'm going to clip this on to my shirt here. Just there. Um, so here it is right here. Off to the side there. We're going to go ahead and start recording. Whoops. <laughs> I moved the switch the wrong way. The switch uh, goes two ways. You press and hold to turn it off, or to power it off or on, and in the opposite direction you press, and that starts a recording. So we're now recording. So I'm gonna go ahead and talk into this microphone for just a moment here, and see what kind of response we get overall in terms of audio quality. 
This is working again with a Sankin COS 11D, which is wired for Sennheiser Evolution Wireless, which is always, uh, which is what the EW in Sennheiser Evolution Wireless stands for. All right, we'll go ahead and stop the recording there. Okay, now what I do, uh, incidentally, this can be used as a card reader, so you can connect it via USB. It does have that USB-C port on the side. And then I've got USB-A, we'll pop that into my USB hub here, and I can move, I have to go into the menu on the Tascam here and put it into card reader mode. So once I put it into card reader mode, then on my computer, I can pop it up. Give me just a second here to get this all sorted out. All right, so we've got the desktop there and Tascam, let's go ahead and go over to the Mac here. Okay, I have to see which is the one that I just recorded. That one was recorded here at 12.30, that must be the one. So we're gonna bop that one to the desktop. It's right there. Let's switch over to Audition and we'll just drag this in right here. Switch over to this file. Okay, this is with the COS 11D. Let's see how this sounds. That starts a recording. So we're now recording. So I'm going to go ahead and talk into this microphone for just a moment here and see what kind of response we get overall in terms of audio quality. This is working again with a Sankin COS 11D, which is wired for Sennheiser Evolution Wireless. Which is always, uh, which is what the EW in Sennheiser Evolution Wireless stands for. All right, we'll go ahead and stop the recording there. That starts a recording, so we're now recording. So I'm going to go ahead and talk into this microphone for just a moment here, and see what kind of response we get overall in terms of audio quality. This is working again with a Sankin COS 11D, which is wired for Sennheiser Evolution Wireless. Which is always, uh, which is what the EW in Sennheiser Evolution Wireless stands for. Okay, well, there's a there's a really basic idea of how it sounds into the Tascam. So that's again the Sankin COS 11D into the Tascam DR10L Pro. Just so you have a sense for what that sounds like. So thanks for the question, Mark. Hopefully that gives you a good sense. I think they don't sound a whole lot different. Uh, well, the the Sankin I always find that the Sankin COS 11D, while it may not sound amazing right out of the recorder on all voices, certainly on mine, um, I do feel like I can usually EQ it to get it sounding pretty good. Um, but it doesn't It doesn't usually sound great right out of the recorder. Okay, Jazz, I have a Tascam 701D, used twice, but since my mix pre's, it's gathering dust. Such shame as Tascam produce nice quality products, but they always seem a generation behind the competition in usability. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I, they're, they do, they tend to compete on price, so they're not quite as competitive on price as Zoom, but they're definitely more competitive on price than Sound Devices is. So that's where I think when you're getting started, to me, Tascams make a whole lot of sense. Um, so for example, all the DR series recorders, those, those make good sense for someone who's getting started. Once you get up past, you know, once you're, we were making a substantial, you know, if your living is coming from producing audio, that's when I think it makes sense to probably upgrade beyond them. But they, they do make some great products. Uh, Mark says, parts of that weren't bad. And thank you for indulging my curiosity. The pleasure is mine. Thanks for the question, Mark. Uh, Danny, regarding types of productions, next application of these... Uh, body pack recorders will be ra uh, rafting trip on the Green River, multiple boats, multiple people. You can do that with a uh, a bag and a boom, I think is what you meant there. Yeah, it's, <laughs> when you're rafting, when you're going through the, raf the, the rapids, I don't know um, what that looks like necessarily, but... Uh, I guess you could look at them as throwaway at that point, depending on the, the budget for the production. But yeah, there's definitely some <laughs> some, some, some opportunities there. Um, from Christopher, someone needs to figure out how to make this 250 
percent price point with a real time code uh, crystal oscillator in this day and age not having real time code is a deal breaker even for smaller productions yeah even electrosonics doesn't put a txc or tcxo in their uh, recorders does the Tascam have an IP rating? Not that I'm aware of it. The, um, the USB-C port is fully exposed, so I doubt it. Uh, same with the, the headphone jack. So there's no cover or anything that comes with it. I don't believe it is IP rated. That's, just, that's the kind of thing you're going to find on higher end gear, usually. All right. All right. Let's hop in to the questions that were submitted ahead of time. The first one comes from Joe, and Joe asks, the Tracky and the DR10L have screw lock external mic input jacks. Which type of 3.5 millimeter male mic plugs are compatible? Um, we just plugged in a Senkin Cos 11D that was wired for Sennheiser Evolution Wireless, and that seemed to work. Um, again, it's not supplying as much voltage as the Senkin technically um, in its specifications requires um, but it's close it, uh, the Tascam offers 2.3 volts the Sankin is looking for 3 to 10 volts undervolting can be dangerous for your equipment so I can't speak to how well that'll work long term but um, I, I found sound wise the included lavalier was not bad um, but continuing on your question if I buy a Sankin cost 11d do I need to specify the Sennheiser jack compatible plug, for example, or something else? Yes, the Sennheiser compatible plug. Cost 11D is available with several different male plugs for various commercial grade wireless systems. And the prosumer grade devices aren't real clear on which one to buy if we want to use something other than the supplied lavalier mic. In 90% of the cases, it's going to be for Sennheiser, Joe. So it's a good question. Um, we just tested a Sennheiser terminated Cost 11D and it worked. Um, again, the voltage isn't ideal, so I don't know what that means long term, if that will damage the microphone at some point, but um, it did work and we did get some decent results. All right, here's another question. This one is actually from Dwayne, and we'll, it's a two-parter. I was under the impression that you couldn't export a 32-bit float signal directly into a camera because the camera just couldn't handle that format. And since the F3, meaning the Sony, oh, sorry, the, the Zoom F3, only operates as a 32-bit float option, I was thinking I would have to record the audio separately and then do some post-production to combine the two together. I did, however, run a few tests, and to my surprise, the F3 will run a line-out signal to my Sony camera and record the audio into the video files. Unless, of course, I did something horribly wrong and I just thought that it was doing that. I'm not saying the audio was perfect or couldn't use some tweaking, but it seemed to work just fine on my initial tests. Was I wrong in thinking everybody said you couldn't do this, or did I mess up something along the way and get a false result? Is it exporting a 32-bit float feed to the camera or downgrading to 24-bit, etc.? And then the second part. <clears throat> I probably need to work out a system to get my camera audio level gain set correctly, but if I do that, am I overlooking something as to why I can't record audio out from my F3 straight into my camera? Dwayne, you absolutely can do that. Um, you're not sending digital audio from the F3 into your Sony camera. You're sending analog audio. And that's the important thing. That's, that's the important thing to understand. Additionally, what you need to understand is that if the audio does exceed 0 dB during the recording, the recording on the F3 should be fine, but the audio coming out of the F3 will be clipped wherever the audio hits 0 dB or above. Okay. So what's happening in essence is the audio comes from the microphone into the F3 and that's analog audio. It gets converted to digital. And in that case, again, if it goes above zero dB at that point, it's fine in the F3. For the output of the F3, it takes that digital audio and converts it back to analog. So it can send it out via an analog collect connection, the 3.5 millimeter output. And in that case, Again, what it's doing is that if it does exceed zero dB at that point in the F3 recorder, anything that goes out of that output is going to be clipped um, coming into the, the, the camera. So that's the thing you need to be aware of. So what I would say to you is, yeah, if you want to save yourself some time and you're careful about setting your input levels and you calibrate the levels between your camera and your F3, then that's a fine workflow. Um, what that means is basically the F3 recording can become your backup or safety recording in case anything does exceed zero dB, and you have to go back and recover it from there. 
but otherwise the audio to the camera should be fine except for those cases where you exceed zero db so you're doing just fine um, and hopefully that makes a little bit more sense now all right danny has a question too we actually kind of covered this a little bit one of the most interesting aspects of the dr10l pro is time code what i would like to know is how all these various time code systems integrate in a practical onset workflow tentacle atomos ultrasync deity etc seems to me that once you have multiple time code systems present it becomes cumbersome time consuming and unreliable due to complexity of getting different systems locked together yeah i think usually from my point of view um, working with time code i prefer to stick to a single system for any given event um, that just makes it simpler however technically you can get them to jam so for example if i'm using a tascam dr10l i can use an ultrasync blue and this can be jammed or this can be essentially the master clock can send its signal to both the tascam dr10l and to an ultrasync one or an atom atom x module and this can actually be jammed to other time code devices with a cable from different manufacturers so it can be jammed to a tentacle sync it can be jammed to a deity time code generator um, or any or, or nano or locket or um, sorry what's the ambient recording like the nano locket or the locket boxes um, you can you can communicate with any of them with a wire and once they're jammed they should stay in sync for 24 hours so um, yeah it is cumbersome but it is also possible and I would like to see as we talked about before I'd love to see all these companies kind of come together and kind of standardize on a wireless protocol that they can all use. I don't think there's a high probability of that happening, but we do see Tentacle evidently is reaching out and to other companies and starting to do that. Atomos is starting to do that, or actually has probably made more headway than anybody else so far, working with both Zoom and Tascam on that. Um, so in any case, yeah, it, it can get cumbersome. Um, yeah, I agree with you. Danny <laughs> in short it would be nice to see them come together and, and work some of that out okay that is what we had submitted ahead of time let's go back over to the chat and see what we've got going in the chat for today Charles any idea if road goes will power a cost 11d at the correct power I believe that the roads supply 2.5 volts of plug-in power so technically not enough um, in practical terms I've used mine and it works um, I, again, I just don't know the long-term effects of undervolting your your uh, lavalier microphone by half a volt. I don't know. I don't know if that's going to damage it long-term or not, or just result in suboptimal performance. It shouldn't. I wouldn't think it would fry it. Um, but anyway, you have to be careful about that kind of thing. These these that's the thing is that these consumer-grade products aren't really made to work with the pro level. They're, they're trying to be as super power efficient as they possibly can. 24 and a half hours with a lith, two lithium AA batteries is impressive, um, but the cost of that is that you're not getting the typical 3 to 10 volts or 3 to 5 volts plug-in power. So it's a sacrifice. Uh, does low voltage power to mic translate to low dynamic range for the mic capsule? Um, I don't know. I think it's cause it depends on the microphone design. Um, I know generally with electronics, you want to avoid undervolting. It can be very damaging. I don't know if half a volt or seven-tenths of a volt, how much of a difference that makes. Um, I don't know. We could, we saw that the cost 11D works. It actually sounded good. Um, it sounded as good to me as any other transmitter pack I've plugged it into, so... Um, didn't uh, but we didn't test the dynamic range really to be honest but um, yeah I'm not sure on that Danny it's a good question Matt I've used my cost 11d with track e ever since I had them with no issues over 100 times sometimes I was it was just for safety reasons okay well that's good to know I don't know what uh, tentacle sync when I went to their website to see how much power the track e supplies um, they didn't have that in the specifications, so I don't know how much the tracky provides in terms of plug-in power. But that's good to know, Matt, that they're working long-term. Thanks for that. From Tentacle, the microphone 
plug-in power is 5 volts. Oh, there you go. So even more microphones are compatible. That's great. Thanks for that, Mark. Um, I didn't see that on their site. I looked in the specs, but didn't see that. So it looks like that was maybe in, a, in an FAQ section or something. Um, but 5 volts is fantastic. So that the tracky is going to be in a pretty good spot then to work with um, most professional microphones, which typically need 3 to 5 volts, sometimes 10, up to 10. Uh, Dean, any quick comments comparing a Tascam DR10L Pro versus the F2BT? Um, I, I haven't looked at the F2BT since it was first released, so I, they may have made some improvements on it. One of the things that I found uh, that would be a little frustrating if you were using multiple F2 units is that I think the app could only connect to one at a time that would be a pain. Um, whereas the Tascan app can connect up to five. So that's a nice thing. Um, I would say the included lavalier with the Tascam sounds a little bit better to me than the Zoom. The Zoom is smaller. Um, that's about all I can say, I guess, right now. They're pretty similar pretty similar otherwise. Um, yeah, if you're into these kind of products, I think that um, uh, somebody said it earlier, the Tascam's a little bit late to this game, and it's a little bit bigger. It's definitely bigger than the Zoom F2 BT, as I recall. Um, but it's, uh, it's, been, it's, a, it's a good, it seems like a good product so far. We'll do a, a full in-depth review here a little bit, and we'll talk a little bit more about how it compares to the, the F2 at that point. Um, as Christopher Wachura points out, you can use a tentacle cable to Limo uh, to shore TL48s. There you go. You can use some other um, nicer microphones with your, with your tentacle tracky, which is nice. Mike, is it possible to use a Mix Pre 3.2 as an audio interface and recorder at the same time? Press record during a Teams call and lost the Mix Pre 3.2 as a source input. Uh, I don't remember off the top of my head, Mike. Um, my recollection was that, yes, you could do that. Um, it could be that that's a specific... You were on a Zoom call, it sounds like, or you were on a Microsoft Teams call. So I don't know. Uh, maybe... Maybe it wasn't uh, sharing very well, but my understanding is I believe that you could do that. Um, I'll have to look that one up. If you want to send me an email, we can correspond there and I can check it out. Okay, Danny is searching. All right, Bartek. Uh, Curtis, not in today's topic, but could you share some tips about building your YouTube channel? What things had the greatest impact on the development of your channel? Ooh. Um, well, it depends on which channel you mean. This one versus the, the main one. They're different channels. Um, that's one story. When I released my first course in 2015, that's my production sound fundamentals course over at school.learnlightandsound.com, one of the things I promised the people that signed up for that course is that we would do weekly question and answer sessions. And so I did that. They were live. And so I started doing that on my main YouTube channel. And after just a couple of months, I was getting a lot of comments that people did not like that. They did not want the those sessions to be on that channel. So I, I set them over here on this channel as a separate channel. And that seemed to help. That was good. Um, people appreciated that because I think... Um, the persona that watches a pre-recorded or OTP type video over the top or, you know, basically video on demand, it's something that's pre-recorded, produced, finished, usually a little bit more concise. Um, that's one persona that's looking for that kind of thing. And each person can can take on different personas at different times. But live streams are a very different thing. This is, this ours, for example, is about an hour long. And people... It's only the dedicated soundies that really want to sit through an hour-long show uh, and and learn a, a topic more deeply. A lot of times people are just looking for a product review. They want to know, is this product worth buying? Um, 
Does it does it sound good? Is it reliable? That kind of thing. And that's that's where they're going to go to a pre-recorded video. And that's where on one channel. So that's one thing I think starting to understand the personas or the the what people want is really helpful for building your channel. Um, I have intentionally made some decisions that probably have made it so that my channel hasn't grown nearly as much, and that's okay with me because I didn't want to continue in, in working on those things. So, for example, uh, consumer-grade lavalier microphones. like, And I'm talking $50 or even $100 and less lavalier microphones. There are a million of them out there. Um, they come and go like crazy. They're from brands you've never heard of. They... Um, I think there's a good bit of inconsistency from unit to unit. And so I used to review lavalier microphones all the time. And um, I just, I'll be honest, I don't have the interest in doing those. I know I know people would appreciate it, but I just, I, I lost interest. I, I can't do it anymore. <laughs> so, and I think you do get a lot of um, those, those, I, I did one, several years ago where I compared, I think, five or seven, I think it was five different consumer lavalier microphones. And of those five, I think only probably two of them might still be in production. The other three are gone. Maybe it's four of them are gone now. Um, so that that's just a market that's changing so much. And one could have a, a single channel dedicated 100% to that. And so I just uh, moved on from that. I just couldn't keep doing it. Um, what I try to do, and it seems what the what seems to re resonate most with my audience is reviews of recorders, audio recorders, specifically field recorders uh, for film and video production. So it's just happened over time where I reviewed several, and um, and one of my best performing videos of all time is the when I do the basically the meta reviews with a whole bunch of different recorders in them for filmmaking and video making. Um, those seem to perform the best. And those are when people are in the market for buying a field recorder because they're going to do video production and they're trying to figure out which one they want to do or they're already doing video production they want to improve their audio game and they go to that video i i'm not the best person to ask this i think i i'm lucky because i started relatively early so the channel really kind of i started dedicating you know aiming mainly for a once a week cadence in about 2014 so i was pretty early in youtube terms or in the youtube history and um, I just got a little bit of a jump start. So I'm not doing all this super optimization that so many other creators are talking about and doing. And I, should I do more of it? Yeah, if I had more time, I would, but I've got a day job. So I'm, you know, between me and Emma, who is our producer now, we're doing the best that we can. Um, I refuse to put goofy face photos for thumbnails. I will not do that. Like, I'm not going to do Mr. Beast thumbnails. Um, so I just take the hit for that. That's fine. Um, somehow, uh, to me, that's not the audience we're going for. We're trying to do basically consumer advocacy and education. Um, and I would say probably education would be my first consumer advocacy. And by consumer advocacy, I mean making video reviews that are not paid for by the manufacturers. Yes, they will give me gear and I'm, I'm okay doing that. That's the only way I can really afford to do this. But I will not do sponsored videos where they pay me to make a video about them. Um, so... In that regard, I consider it consumer advocacy. So from my point of view, these reviews are for the audience. They're not for the manufacturer. And I have had manufacturers that will not work with me anymore. They will not talk to me or send me products anymore. And that's fine. Um, and then secondly, education. To, or I would actually, I would say actually first education, secondly, consumer advocacy. So that's just how I look at it. Um, I'll put my face on some thumbnails. It seems like YouTube has just really gra really kind of clung on to that concept that you I mean, their channels that start and within six months are just huge like millions of subscribers and they're optimizing the heck out of everything and they're interesting some of them um, but that's not what we do here so we're just going to kind of hold our course for now that's a long-winded way of saying that <laughs> all right what else have we got in the chat you can use it as an interface and record simultaneously. Thank you, Tim. This is talking about the mix pre. Teams tends to be the culprit in most cases. Discord also has issues with PC-based computers with some browsers. Okay, so it sounds like Tim, um, or Mike, there may be a little something going on with Teams there. Danny says, future topic, cover all these emerging AI transcription tools. Ah, that's a good one, Danny. We've actually been playing with that. 
we've been using one called Zubtitles. That's an online service. And then we've kind of we switched over to DaVinci Resolve. It's not perfect either. It's giving us some trouble. Um, so we're still trying to find the perfect one. But yeah, it's a good future topic. Um, I'd like to say I'd like to see Final Cut add something like that as well. And I'd like to see the one in DaVinci Resolve mature as well. But they're, the DaVinci Resolve one is actually pretty good at the transcription part, but the formatting part is a little bit wonky. So we're working through some of those details. But yeah, it's a good topic, and we will we can we can come back and cover that. Mark, uh, interaction and collaboration with others is a benefit of this type of channel. Case in point, I have a fabulous connection from being on this channel. Um, I would not have had otherwise. And that's I, I think that's right. I think live streams to a large extent are about connecting with the community, um, whereas over-the-top videos are not as much that. You can get a little bit of that in the comments, but for to a large extent, that's what live streams are better at. So live streams are not as efficient at learning necessarily. You can go deeper, um, but they use a lot more time to get there, whereas a really well-produced, uh, pre-recorded and produced video, you can you can learn and teach much more efficiently. At least in, in, it's possible to. Um, not that all channels do that or all videos do that, but it is possible to. And yeah, I, I totally agree. I love. The, I actually love the live streams. They're a lot of fun, and the the connection that it builds and the community that it builds is really really valuable. I love workflow videos. How to control the chaos. I agree. That's another one of mine that did pretty well. Is well decent. Um, we talked about our YouTube. Um, just sort of video workflow in general, and then another one that was specific to our audio workflow for YouTube videos. Um, those both did pretty well as well. I appreciate the choices on YouTube thumbnails. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Eric. <laughs> uh, it's not really our style to do those goofy, um, melodramatic expressions on the thumbnails that are largely, they just seem can very candy-coated to me. Um, thanks, Joe. I love the standards you've set for your channels. I appreciate that. By the way, I just, I asked ChatGPT best audio channels and yours was number one. <laughs> thanks very much, Charles. Um, and glad to see that ChatGPT is with us on that. Okay. Well, it's about time to wrap things up. Get out there, make some great sound, and we'll talk to you again next week. Take care, everybody.